We are talking with my friend, Mark Dever. Mark is married to Connie. They have two adult children. Mark serves as pastor of Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. He is the author of many books on the local church, including Nine Marks of a Healthy Church. Mark has been a dear, dear friend and mentor of mine for over 12 years. And Mark, thanks for hopping on to Sing Global today. Delighted to be here with you. How are you, brother? Um, well, I'm trying to think theologically and vibrantly. <laughs> Excellent. That's what we're all about. Now, Mark, I hope many of our listeners are familiar with your preaching or your books. They may not know that you are big into music. You have a CD collection. Now, folks, that stands for compact disc. Uh, and your CD collection comprises many, many, many different genres of music. And you have a deep appreciation for hymnody. How did you get into music and how, how have you developed your knowledge of music over time? Uh, I got into music by having my own record player in my room in uh, the 1960s in Kentucky growing up. And I squirreled away all the records I could of my own, stealing from my parents' collection in the living room, and then slowly but surely building up my own, which began with Glenn Miller and big band stuff. Excellent. And when did you get into hymns? Uh, I, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe sometime after I became a Christian. Uh, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know if you'd asked me when I was 20 years old, if you're into hymns, if I would have known to say yes. Although by that point, I already would buy hymnals at used bookstores when I would find them. So I could look through them and read them in my quiet times. And, and so walk us through, we, we, you know, because we're all busy, you're busy, you're caring for a flock. So if you use a hymnal during your devotional time, yeah. you know, I assume you're mainly reading the Bible, you're praying. So where does the hymnal fit in? Oh, the hymnal will tend to be at the beginning. So the way I would start and I would not sing, I would just read uh, and I probably won't read it out loud unless Connie's not here. Uh, I'll just read to him and I'll read it slowly and stop probably after each line or certainly stands and just meditate on it. Mm. As I think it's a wonderful example. Um, very, very much like how you say Valley of Vision. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. Uh, and the sorts of the sort of close reading of scripture and meditating on scripture, reading slowly and prayerfully yeah. translates to reading a hymn, which the best hymns should be meditations on scripture. Yeah, and, that's true. Yeah, they, they lead us into and out of God's word. For someone who, who really isn't used to using one or, or, or yeah. speak to pastors who may not know their way around a hymn, why, why would we spend our time grabbing a good hymnal and, and doing that? And do you have any particular you, you recommend? Yeah, hymnals are glorious resources. They are cheap these days because so many churches have gotten rid of them they've just flooded the market so you can easily pick them up for a dollar or five dollars i mean just very little money um they are almost always there may be exceptions to this but they're almost always arranged thematically so it will go through the the heads of theology uh the, the first will be about god uh, god the father uh, or first real trinity and then god the father god the son god the holy spirit and then it will have different parts of the work of christ and uh, there'll be usually a, a section on the church and on the second coming and on heaven and the afterlife. And uh, there are also different indices you can use in the back that are very useful. There'll be a meter index so you can, can find a hymn of the same meter and you can switch tunes. If this meter is a, you know, a four, 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 you can go find another hymn that's that and you can use those words with that tune. You can see how you like that. Um, there's uh, going to be an index usually of scripture. So there will be often scripture citations given in a hymn or about a hymn, and you can find those in the back. So if you're looking for something from Colossians 3.16, you can see, well, is there any hymn that's based on this or that refers to this? Uh, and there are going to be also indices for who composed the music uh, and who composed the words. So if you like Horatius Bonar, you can find like lots of hymns by Horatius Bonar. So it's just very useful stuff. One. Well, the other thing is that they're curated, 
often by committees or denominations. Yeah. Uh, and so you're yeah. seeing what hopefully wise and thoughtful think are the hymns of the past that are most worth holding on to. No, which is why some modern hymnals of current denominations are bad because they have screened out anything about the blood. Uh, they've screened out. Uh, I remember the one famous a few years ago wouldn't put in in Christ alone uh, because Keith and Kristen wouldn't agree to change the words. Yeah. Stuart Townend's lyric, the wrath of God was satisfied. And That's Stuart right. and Keith insisted that that is a key doctrine. It's substitutionary yep. atonement. We have to sing it. Yeah. So uh, that's all really helpful. Now, you, as a hymnal-loving pastor in your 30s, yep. came to Capitol Hill Baptist Church. It was a different decade. In fact, it was a different century. In fact, it was a different millennium than the one we are currently in. Mama. It, was 19, it was 1994. Who was picking the songs when you turned up? Did you let them keep picking the songs? What did you do? Uh, the songs were picked by the person who arranged the service, and that was Dear George, who was a retired missionary to Pakistan. Well, I told them that I thought since I was the only elder, all the public teaching of the church was my responsibility, and therefore I would do that. So I started attending the church in July, but I didn't start leading things until October. So July, September, uh, July, August, September, I simply sat there and attended the services that they planned. So I got to know their repertoire, their preferences, what things were like. And then I tried to, as much as possible, use that idiom, um, but just pick the best from that idiom uh, and then slowly introduce newer songs that uh, they wouldn't know. Do you still have oversight of song selection today? I mean, the church has grown. You have a staff. Is that something that you have delegated? No. Uh, I think that that's part of the basic composing of the public teaching of the church. So I am anxious that the words that get burned into our memories, uh, and music does that. Music is so efficient and effective uh, at scripture memory or verse memory uh, that I want to be very careful about what theology, what ideas are placed in there. Yeah. And uh, also, I'm, I'm always going to be looking for new stuff, new, not meaning written this year, but new, like new to our congregation, maybe it's from the fifth century, but I'm, I'm always going to be looking, to try to expand our horizons. And when you say expand horizons today, people think that means written this month as opposed to last month. I'm thinking more historically, I'm thinking, okay, we've got a lot from the 20th century, a lot from the 21st century. Uh, how's the 15th century doing? Is it represented at all? How about what Christians were singing in the 18th century? Are, are we getting any of that? So I'm, I'm wanting to, I have a bit different perspective on what I'm looking for, for the, from the riches of the church to our congregation today. We've talked about selecting songs. What are some other things that a, a pastor, particularly the main preaching pastor, can do to encourage and foster a culture of congregational singing? Well, kind of back behind that, before I answer the question directly, I think you want to make sure, you want to be the one that looks over the service that's planned and make sure there's a unity to the service, that there's a progression, that the prayers and the scripture readings and the songs, whether they're congregationally sung or performed, uh, that they all fit the, the, what, you're, what you're trying to highlight, particularly from God's word that, that morning. So I would say that as the preacher, you're the one who knows what the point of that message is. So you're the one who's in the best position to do that. Now, the good news is you're not going to highlight anything that's true about God from Scripture, and it'd be unhelpful to understanding his word. So this is this is one of those times where you almost can't get it wrong. The Holy Spirit has so made it that all the gar animals work with all the other gar animals. So you can mix and match all you will, and it will work. And sometimes it'll work unusually well, and people will give you credit for genius you don't deserve. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, I hadn't seen that, but boy, that did work well. But there are, you know, there are simple things where if you're going to be talking about sin, or you're going to be talking about the cross, you're going to be talking about the atonement, you're going to be talking about the wrath of God or his righteousness or his holiness. You know, there are going to be themes. So one of the things I try to do is uh, at the beginning of my semester, I will have a document where I lay out uh, what I'm going to be preaching on, including the theological theme and the anthropological theme. 
So what this is telling us about God and what this is telling us about humanity. And I want those to be distinct from each other. I don't want to have the same one every week. I want to make sure I have a different one over these four months for every Sunday so that it's not too repeated. And that pushes me to a little variety in terms of scripture readings and, and songs that are sung. And, and you develop that theological theme and anthropological theme just by studying from the, the text. text. Yeah. Exactly. And trying to summarize it in a, a word or a phrase or a concept. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, the anthropological theme may be things like uh, vanity or trust or work it can be good or bad. The theological theme may be, you know, God, the father, redemption, the sovereign God. So the very, very general things, things that can be helpful in choosing good passages to read uh, and to sing. Now, as far as congregational singing to encourage it, the main trick I've got, I've got a few, but let me tell you the most important one is get rid of the accompaniment. Or if that's too strong sauce for you, if I sound like I'm Alexander Campbell and the Church of Christ, then I'll just say, okay. Or it sounds like Spurgeon or Calvin. This is like the Protestant Reformation, much of it, the Reformed side. Um, t- t- tone down the, uh, the accompaniment. Make the accompaniment quiet enough that the congregation can hear each other singing. Uh, that's a little scary to folks because they have a kind of concert driven idea these days. Like we want it to sound like a really good concert. And I'm thinking that is the surest way to kill congregational singing. Everybody will close their mouths and they'll listen to your great artistry and they will not engage themselves in the same way. And one of the other things that I just want to highlight about how you as a pastor try to lead your church to sing is your example uh, so I personally agree with you that simpler accompaniment can facilitate or can cultivate the congregation leaning into their own voice. I think aca- going a cappella as often as possible, as you've mentioned, is really helpful for that. On non-unison songs. Unison songs, it does nothing. It's like a lead weight often. But if you do it on songs with parts that are widely known and can be at least partially sung by the congregation, that will increase the parts and it will sparkle. Yeah, I'm not as down on unison acapella as you are, but I, I think normally... All right, trust me, that. guys. Listen, trust me. Matt's <laughs> he's, a good he's man. usually right. I have more experience. Do not try the acapella on the unison often. That will not be helpful. Well, yeah. uh, churches that sing in unison usually have parts being sung in a microphone by a couple of people who are helping to lead. And so those will sometimes add a little bit. But the thing I really want to highlight is your own example. You sing loud and enthusiastically. You sing as if you are enjoying it because you are. And you're not looking over your notes. Uh, and you're in the front row. Uh, and your church, the, the, the brothers and sisters who tithed and sacrificially gave their nickels and dimes to build that building in 1911 were very wise because the, the seats are arranged so you can kind of see and hear each other. What a Just gift like that is. Just like your church is in Nashville. Well, our church in Nashville, Edgefield Church, has kind of the same architectural layout, just smaller as yours. Yeah. Um, And so I'm not asking you to respond to that, but I just want to highlight for the folks listening, if you are a pastor, sing. And if you're not a pastor, encourage your pastor to sing and tell him it makes a difference. And I'll just say as as a pastor, I think it looks discouraging if you're a pastor and you're not paying attention to the service. Now, I understand emergencies happen, things go on, you, you, you do what you need to do. But on the whole, normally, uh, I think you will help your congregation better by being the leader in your example and how you're engaging in the songs, the prayers, the scripture readings. Yeah. Mark, yeah. there's so much we could talk about, but we will stop it there. Thank you so much for your wisdom and your time and your example and for sharing that with us today. Thank you for He Will Hold Me Fast and all the other contributions you've made to this, brother. 